<clears throat> Welcome back for uh, those of you who were here yesterday. Uh, we had a great day um, uh, with uh, uh, discussions uh, around the nature of work. Uh, and I think uh, Mohammed did a great job of summarizing uh, the discussions yesterday and uh, kind of pulling out some of the, the most important themes. Uh, today, we're going to continue our discussion and the the theme today is digital wellness, and you know, this can this probably wouldn't have even been a sensical term 20 years ago. Uh, but today, uh, everyone has some kind of you know, sort of neural response to uh, that term. Now, they probably are different, uh, or at least they uh, they, um, uh, they they, they uh, stimulate different kinds of thoughts. But we all kind of have this sense of what kind of work-life balance, what kind of time allocation, what kind of uh, stressors and relaxers uh, uh, are uh, happening to me personally uh, uh, in my place of work. And that place of work itself doesn't even make sense anymore because um, some of my best uh, ideas, I think, happen in the shower. And if I can only remember them, uh, I can, you know, after I get out and quickly write it down, um, it usually makes it for a pretty good day. But this notion of where do we work? When do we stop working? How do we you know, um, uh, work effectively without sort of only working in our lives? is uh, something that I think all of us kind of you know, find our own strategies for. So today, um, we've got a panel uh, of people who actually think a lot about this and uh, 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 help other people think about it. And I'm really excited to uh, uh, hear what they have to say and to have, have some discussion. And again, as yesterday, we hope that the audience will be active participants. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll have uh, Lori Heat is going to uh, do the kind of uh, deep brief discussion uh, after the panel. So without further ado, take it away, Fred. All right, thanks, Gary. Um, and uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you to my panelists for joining. Um, we're, we're bringing up a, <laughs> oh, there she is, <laughs> Georgie. Okay, we've got our third panelist. Um, Hope everyone sees my sneakers today. Uh, we, we got the assignment. You got the assignment. <laughs> okay. I love it. Um, okay. Well, well, thanks. Today we are going to be talking about uh, digital well-being and digital well-being in the context of work and in how we interact with consumers and how we interact with uh, individuals using technology. And so, you know, I think setting the tone, we're in an era where. Um, in the past couple of years, we've seen a decade's worth of change in the workforce, and a decade's worth of change in what employees are expecting of work. We've also seen tremendous challenges with regards to um, you know what people are facing uh, to get. To um, we had a guest on our podcast who kind of made this interesting point. You know, in the pandemic, we all we all simply just kind of went home. And we said, okay, we're we're gonna we're gonna work. And, and most of all, most of us, we got this done. But we didn't really think about the ramifications of you know, what is this doing to us? What is it doing to our bodies? What is it doing to our you know uh, various systems? And um, so I think we're now in an era where we need to think about how we make people well in their work and how we set up environments where people can do their best work. Um, and so uh, you know, with these challenges in mind, today we're going to come together. And talk about some of our learnings. And we brought some really great panelists together from uh, a diverse to, uh, to give us their perspectives and to have a discussion. And we've got open up to the audience on this. We want this to be kind of a moving conversation. So, um, you know, what we'll do is we'll go around and tell you a little bit about our work. Um, and we will, um, uh, you know, we've got a couple of questions we're going to discuss. And then we're going to you know, hopefully open it up and have a, uh, a great conversation for the hour. So I've got three panelists with me today, and I'm really excited to have all of them with us, um, especially because uh, I'm meeting some of them for the first time in person. Yeah. 
people who I worked with for many, many years. So that's that's on me. Like I knew I knew these guys before the pandemic. So uh, mm -hmm. I need to like leave my you know my six mile radius of Carver. <laughs> <laughs> but um but I just wanted to say thank you so much for coming over and thank you for um for taking the time. I'm so excited to be so uh our first panelist is Juan Sanchez who is the uh, co-founder and CEO of Bagby. And so um, I've known Juan for many, many years uh, as he has been sort of pushing the envelope in terms of physical products and how we are well in the home and how we sort of examine our relationship with technology. And so he's got a line of products uh, known as uh, a Bagby, which um, uh, he'll tell you about, which has been, uh, um, Kind of revolutionizing how we think about our relationship with tech. Um, I have Marcy Rader with us. Um, I've known Marcy for a number of years. Uh, Marcy is a uh, consultant and she's an expert. She's a keynote speaker. Um, I've heard from many, many of my friends who work in the triangle. Oh, Marcy came to my office and she mentioned freedom. That's that's just like every time I hear that, I'm like, oh my, yes, Marcy. And you um, didn't pay me. And I didn't I know, even yeah, know. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's it's wonderful. Um, so Marcy will tell you about her experience. Um, she's her latest book is uh, Work Well, Play More. Um, Marcy has a wonderful mailing list that I'm a member of. She's got so many things on her plate. Um, so I'll let you tell her, uh, but let her tell you her story. And then uh, joining us remotely, we have Georgie Powell. Who is uh, who is do, doing many things in the scope of digital well-being? She's the vice president of partnerships and strategy at Freedom, uh, my company. She is the co-founder of Sentient. I'm sorry, the founder of Sentient Digital, which is a digital well-being consultancy. Um, she hosts the Freedom Matters podcast, which is our uh, podcast um, and a series of conversations um, uh, with experts in the digital well-being space. Um, she's also the co-founder of the Space app. Uh, which was an early digital well-being program. And I realized uh, I didn't introduce, my, introduce myself. So my, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'm among friends here, but yeah, my name is Fred Stutzman. Um, I have uh, been in the SILS orbit for many, many years. Uh, I did my PhD at SILS. Uh, Gary is my advisor. Um, after SILS, I taught at SILS for a little while. And then I founded uh, Freedoms, which uh, is a company that helps people um, turn off the distractions so they can do their best work. Um, we've been doing it for over 10 years. Uh, we've grown from a side project to a, a company of over 25 people worldwide. And we, um, we've helped millions of people uh, with their, um, manage their uh, relationship with technology and uh, use it in a more positive way. So uh, short introductions aside, uh, and I see we've got Georgie on the line. So our opening questions are pretty simple. Who are you? What are you working on? So why? Right. <laughs> well, I prefer a uh, quite short deck. Don't worry, you don't want to be like a super long deck. Uh, so, um, you know, like I just want to start like saying like what is our why. So, um, Bagby is a company I founded uh, in July, August 2017. And uh, basically, we define ourselves as digital wellness with a human soul. And um, this is why, because um, basically, we think that we can overcome this uh, problem with technology, with the dependency to digital technology in a different way. And we wanted to add this kind of more human component. So we decided to create uh, sustainable uh, digital free solutions. Um, as Fred mentioned, actually, like physical products that help us disconnect. Um, and we do it this way because we think that uh, digital wellness is all about like um, uh, building positive habits and make them routines. So, you know, we find moments where we can actually uh, disconnect. I don't have anything against apps, obviously. You know, I think technology is, is great and it's gonna be here. And uh, what we're trying to do is basically find moments that are like tech free, right? So, you know, who, who I am, um, I always say that I have two, two lives, you know, my previous life is this one, where I, I was, uh, I spent 12 years um, and uh, on digital marketing agencies, I come from the advertising industry, um, pretty fun 12 years, to be honest. Uh, 
And then I worked in different countries, Madrid uh, and cities, Madrid, Paris, Luxembourg, Singapore. Um, here actually it was great, but uh, you know, I realized that I was part of the distraction. I think, you know, I define myself like as a digital uh, distraction creator. And my life now is very different, you know? I let my hair grow. Um, <laughs> I become a dad, I have two beautiful daughters, two and four. So life has changed a lot. And, uh, you know, I think my life is simpler now. I, I work from home in, uh, in Raleigh. I have a small team. And, you know, like now I kind of define myself a little bit of my purpose is to reduce uh, the digital distractions that we are seeing. So this is a little bit like who I am. And um, to the question, like what, what we are working on, um, we're working on different things. Our, our focus is more consumer, but we started like um, going towards the, um, the corporate. And, you know, this is a, a community that we call Digital Talks Heroes. And it's basically a community of people who have done or gone through a digital detox. So we want to create, we create a visual for them, we engage them, we kind of want to raise their profile. So Instagram is not just about beautiful faces, but it's also, you know, people who uh, bring this conversation up. Um, it's another thing, this is a new product that we launched, um, which is a mindful and sustainable text pad. Basically, the innovation here is we actually simply add a pocket for your phone on the left. So basically, when you are working on your computer, you have a little area where you can leave your phone and then you can work uh, more productively. You know, it seems simple, but I think are, um, are those little changes that we do in our routines that can make a, an impact for us. And then, you know, something that we, we do now and we have been doing for, for the last uh, year is uh, we are customizing our solutions. So this is, for example, uh, the original idea of Bagby, actually the, the world first sleeping, sleeping bag for your phone. So you can actually hang it on your doorknob. And before you uh, go into your bedroom, um, you can remind yourself to, you know, go in there and, and not bring your, your phone. So you don't, you don't spend like two hours early before you go to bed. And the first thing that you do in the morning is checking your phone. So we, you know, we customize all these items. This is a concept for Airbnb. We're trying to convince them to make all their bedrooms phone free. I know it's a challenge, but we'll see. And you know, there are some clients actually, and Marcy is one of our clients too. So, you know, we are all well connected. And this is a little bit like who I am and what are the things that we're working on at Bagby. Thank you. Sure. I am Marcy Rader. I'm the founder of Rader Co. And we are a health-powered productivity company. And we go into different organizations and provide workshops and private coaching. And we also speak um, all over the world. Health-powered productivity, because if you're checking the boxes, but you're staying up all night to do it, that's not very productive. Well, it's productive, but it's not healthy. And it's not effective. And so we coach people to be effective always with health at the forefront. So it's one thing to work in front of your computer all day, but are you eating your lunch in front of the screen as well? Um, one uh, interesting thing, we, he, he did not show this, but there is a, um, a thing that you can hang on the wall to put your phones in. And we celebrated a phone-free New Year's Eve party a few years ago, and it was such an interesting experiment that I ended up writing two stories about it because I had friends that actually felt sick to their stomach putting their phone in this holder. And since then, we have had phone-free Friday nights at our house for the last three years. With Fred, um, with Freedom, as I said, you know, I was promoting Freedom long before I even knew Fred and knew that he was in the area and um, was even on a, um, a news story for WRAL. And it's finding these types of, um, finding technology or analog products to bring in for individuals and businesses to help them with, you know, help them to be able to handle the technology that's there. Because what we don't want to rely on is our willpower. When we rely on our willpower, then we're, you know, we're, we're making it harder for ourselves all day long by just, you know, like 
I'm just not going to touch my phone. I'm just not going to touch my phone. I'm just not going to go to Facebook. I'm just not going to go to Instagram. You know, why use up your willpower? Just turn on freedom. And then you don't have to. And the last thing I'll say is I have been LinkedIn only for the last three years and I still have friends. <laughs> I still know my family. <laughs> so with that, I'll turn it over to Georgie. All right, Georgie. Thanks, Marcy. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Amazing, cool. Um, hi everyone. So I think Fred did a really good job of, of summarizing the roles that I currently have, but in terms of background, um, I used to work for Google where I managed partnerships for uh, YouTube and Google Play. And um, I loved the job. It was kind of a really, I, I saw it as an opportunity to, to democratize content, which I thought was really important. And that's why I went to do that job. But whilst I was working there, I started to realize that ultimately what I was trying to do was to get people to spend more time watching YouTube. And a lots of them were 16 year old um, boys who were doing that at the expense of perhaps being out in the world. And, um, and so, yeah, during that time, I also had my first baby and I was missing out on really important personal moments with my own kind of device habits and being distracted by my devices. And so I decided to change my own habits and I left Google and I started Space, which along with Freedom, I guess, I think Freedom had been around longer, but it was one of the early sort of screen time trackers to get just to kind of gives people a sense of how much time they're spending on their devices and to give people a bit of a wake up call so that they were were, were more aware of, of how they were using tech. Um, and yeah, since then, obviously Fred summarized a lot and uh, sort of the, the, the roles that I now have, but I guess all my work centers around one question, which is <clears throat> how can we use technology consciously in a way that helps us as individuals and also as communities to thrive? And I feel like what's happened in many cases is we've started to use technology just by default. You know, we have a number of habits, we've adopted technology, often because they have these kind of, they're entertaining, they, they help us solve problems, they're positive in many ways, but actually when you layer them together, um, cumulatively, they're having, in many cases, quite negative impacts on our lives and the habits that we have with them are undermining perhaps the better way that we could we could choose to live our life. So for me, digital wellbeing and, and this whole conversation now is about saying, okay, technology is fantastic, it has a place, but let's take a step back. Let's reimagine how we want to live our life, how we want to do our best work. And let's put technology back in, in a way that helps us to do that, in a way that's sustainable and we can do deep work and we can connect really well. Um, and we can also kind of, yeah, build our wellbeing at the same time. So that's a bit about me and what I care about. Thank you so much, Georgie. And um, it's it's interesting. So we've got a couple of questions we're going to rip off of, but um, just sort of drawing some connections already. Uh, one of the things uh, Georgie and Juan mentioned is the fact that they've sort of been on the other side of the equation. And um, you know, myself, my story, I was a little bit on the other side of the equation, not so much as a producer, but a researcher and studying um, the problems. And you know that insight into um, you know what have we caused? You know what are the what are the implications of this technology that we're developing? It's pretty interesting. So you know maybe with that as a lens, we could actually jump into our first question. And I think it's a personal one, um, and we're all going to have different perspectives. But um, you know what does what does digital well-being mean to you? What does it mean to be digitally well? And you know how do we how do we create that? So, you know, Marcy, can I give that to you first? Because I know you've thought about this so much. Yeah. For me personally, it's being able to leave my house without nomophobia, which is the fear of not being available and being attached to my phone. Um, you know, we, we rely so much on our phones for different things. I use it for directions. Um, I'm gluten-free, so I have an app that's called Find Me Gluten-Free, so I can find restaurants that way. Um, if I'm meeting someone, then they can text me. So it's, it's being able to have those device-free moments, going to a concert without my phone, <gasps> the horror, you know, and um, going to a party without my phone. And I have incorporated a lot more digital free time in my life since the pandemic. And I just keep finding more and more ways to add it. That's that's what digital well-being means for me. It's different for everyone. Yeah, um, there's a good point that you made about the, um, you know, like uh, that 
how you can leave the home without nomophobia or with the need of a phone, no? And uh, I wrote about like something that we call the, the fallacy of minimalism. And it's basically, you know, like you have a lot of people with, you know, uh, houses with little things. So they decluttered a lot, a lot of things, but they put all of them in their phones, you know? So <laughs> it's, you know, you have, you don't have an agenda now. You don't have a notebook. You don't have a, a GPS. You don't have a, an alarm clock. You don't have, a, I mean, the list is uh, endless. And then you put that on your phone, right? So it's normal, actually, if you think about it, it's normal that we spend so much time in our phone because all these functionalities or all these things, they are necessary, right? So, you know, I think sometimes it's important to, you know, it's fine if, you know, like if the notebook takes space, it's, it's still okay, you know, because you're gonna be away from, from your phone. So there is a, there's a conversation there that I, I think is, is, um, is pretty interesting. Now, sorry, regarding the question. Um, and I think digital wellness uh, for me is, um, as I mentioned, when I was introducing myself, it's all about like creating uh, and building these positive habits uh, that turn into routines. So we can achieve the goal of improving our relationship with, with our digital devices. And I think that is the, the main goal, how we can improve that relationship because technology is gonna stay here um, it's going to evolve from phones to VR. It's going to, it's going to be, I mean, we need technology. Technology is actually not bad. I think the problem, and we see that in the workspace, but also in the, uh, in the consumer side is when people, and this is happening now, especially with teenagers, where, when they spend more time in the digital world than in the real world. So, you know, if you spend more time, for example, on Instagram, uh, than you spend on the real time, on the real world, you think that the real world is actually Instagram. And that is, that is a problem. When it comes to the workspace, uh, we can talk about like, you know, more distractions or how that impacts uh, productivity. But I think at the end of the day, I think digital wellness is all about building these habits. So we have the control over technology and we can benefit for such a, an important thing and an important uh, um, tool, right? Yeah, I love um, that comment one you made about the sort of how the, the phone becomes a Swiss army knife. And it's one of the things I often recommend is this, this concept, like just take it all apart. You don't need to have all your tools in one place. It's just a trap. Like we can still have um, watches and alarm clocks. Bagby do love the alarm clocks, by the way. Um, and um, watches and calculators. These are, you know, quite useful independent tools that will stop us from always having to pick up our telephones. Um, anyway, yes. Yeah, so coming back to the definition of digital well-being. So for me, I think I mentioned earlier, sort of broadly, it's this concept of using technology consciously in a way that um, means we feel like technology is working for us rather than us working for technology, which I think sometimes can 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 be the case. So really using it with intentionality and 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 choosing when, where, how we want to use products that make our our values better, that make what we're trying to achieve in the day better. Um, in terms of personally, I think what it means to me has shifted over time, but what I'm quite interested in now is kind of challenging myself to understand what is the human need that I'm looking for when I turn to tech and when I when I pick up my phone, like, is it because I am seeking social reassurance in some way? Is it because I'm bored and I'm looking for a distraction? Is it because I'm wrestling with a hard piece of work, which I don't feel comfortable doing and I'd actually rather distract myself? Is it, you know, with everything that's going on in the world, this sort of this search for news and feeling like I need to stay informed and connected to the rest of the world. And for me, digital wellbeing comes partly from recognizing that technology meets and serves a loads of human needs. And if we're able and better at identifying what need we have in any particular moment, we can then kind of be more conscious about whether or not we opt in to using that tech and whether that tech is actually gonna help solve that need or not. Um, and in many cases, you know, you're probably not gonna get the social reassurance, for instance, that you're looking for when you go on social media. And if you're kind of more aware of what's driving you there in the first place, you might be able to make a more conscious choice about it. So that's what I'm quite interested in at the moment is kind of the psychological drivers between our tech, behind our tech habits. And, you know, it's, it's interesting as I was listening to these answers, it's kind of like thinking about my own perspective on this question. And um, it's, it's, it reflects the arms race, I think, that we see in uh, technology. And I, I'm just going back to like when 
we developed the first version of freedom when I developed the first version of freedom. And I, you know, it was, it was a little app that turned off the internet on the computer. And I remember thinking like, oh, problem solved. Like, good, <laughs> we took care of it. Um, but over many years, I've realized, no, the problem is like constantly evolving. And actually, um, my, my current take on it is, you know, it's some mix of technology and a lot of mix of like self-awareness. And, uh, um, you know, just um, having these critical moments where you can say like, is this something I want to do? And and that's that's really tough because you know the technology pulls you, and the technology is reflexive. Um, and like I'm hearing I'm hearing these discussions around like you know unpacking or unbundling the technology, which is really kind of interesting too. Like you know my my personal take is I don't have social media apps on my phone. I kind of just use my phone for work, and it's got kind of a single purpose. Um, so you know, along those lines, maybe actually we can we can jump into uh, some tips and tricks and like some things that you all do in your in your daily lives to to fight back against the tech. And um, maybe we can also, if anybody's got cool ideas in the audience or things they're doing, we can we can involve that too. And then we'll shift into more of a discussion of work. But I just kind of wanted to push on that theme a little bit more. You know. What are you what are you all doing that works for you in terms of like you know pushing back on the tech? I'll start. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so for me, I also, well, as I said, I'm LinkedIn only, but I don't have it on my phone. I don't have our project management system is not on our phone. Um, I don't check email on my phone. And I do have an Apple Watch, but and I love it. But on days where I really want to be focused, mm -hmm. I wear my 23 year old sector watch. And um, so that I'm not distracted by anything. Because, what's that? Oh, yes, yes. I noticed that all three of us um, had like old fashioned watches. Mine still gets notifications. I got to turn it off. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It works. yeah. But, but <clears throat> it is nice to have it when, you know, at certain times. I, I do love that watch. But I find that, um, like I said, on the days that I really want to be focused, I want to be focused on you. It's so easy to just kind of look and see if anybody texts me or whatever that is. So I just don't wear it. And then um, I have, I'm lucky enough to have an infrared sauna at home. And every day my transition from work is to go and sit in my sauna for 40 minutes. And it's a device-free zone. And I do crossword puzzles. On paper and I read and um, the first year that I had this on I would take my phone in and I would use a meditation app and and different things and I thought you know I'm taking I don't need this phone to meditate and it was really hard to just sit in there it was really hard and that's why I started bringing in crossword puzzles and things and so for me it goes back to again finding those digital free moments and that's what I work on with my, our private coaching clients is, you know, where do you want to be digital free? Is it the bathroom? Is it at your table? Is it, you know, when you're with your family? And then we kind of work from there. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with that um, a point. You know, I think something that you can start doing and you're going to see the, the, the benefit is, you know, not bringing your phone in the bedroom. You know, that's, that's actually... Well, the the reason we we created Bagby, uh, it was it started actually as a as a couple's challenge with my wife, um, and uh, it was all about that. It's like you know, let's set up a, a place where you know, like we don't go and it's two hours on the phone or I'm talking to you and it's like uh, hello, you know. Um, so I think that um, kind of helped you. Like it's it's a it's a great first um, step and a great first entry door to. To digital wellness you know we don't realize um again i think um, um we mentioned it before um georgie mentioned it before about like uh, you know being conscious or or uh, intentional um i think the problem is exactly there is that time that you spend on technology that you don't want to spend or really like that you are not you don't have an intention to spend you know and there are hours a day that we do that you know mm -hmm. So I think um, yeah, trying to reduce those moments of unintentional use of technology, it's a great start. 
Yeah, I think, yeah, you have to have a break. And it comes back to this sort of self-awareness piece, Fred, that you reflected on. If you don't have time to let your mind wander and to be bored and to be creative and kind of just let your brain like relax and decompress, then you're never going to be able to work out um, really who you are and what your drivers are and why you're forming habits like you form. So you have to create those moments in your day or your week where you are device free. Um, for me, some of the sort of smaller changes that I made was I made a pact myself to really limit how much I use my phones in front of my kids. And um, it's not easy, but it has really helped our family life because we don't have arguments over screens because the kids don't see them as something that's attractive. Um, and uh, I'm, re I'm really grateful for that. Um, the other thing I do is I have a pack with myself that I'll only check my messages on my phone if I'm in a time and a place where I know that I have enough time or headspace to respond to anything that could be waiting for me there. So, you know, don't check it in the checkout queue because there might be a text message from a friend which requires kind of quite a complex answer or something. You're not going to be able to respond then. You're just going to think about it. Wait until you're in a moment where you actually potentially could properly respond. And that's, that's a tip that's really helped me. Um, yeah, definitely no phones in the bedroom. I, I think, you know, someone once described it as, you know, do you want to take Trump into bed with you? I mean, I think the equivalent now is probably, do you want Putin in bed with you? Um, it's just not good for anyone. <laughs> so just giving yourself the time to kind of rest your brain uh, is really important. So yeah, there's certainly some things. The other thing that I would love, unfortunately it's not available to me on the network that I'm currently on, but I think for you all in the States, it's totally different. I am hanging on for when the light phone works on my network in the UK, because I think it's absolutely amazing for anyone that don't, doesn't know about them. There are others that are available, but um, I, I love the light phone. It basically is, a, it's a, a very simple device that tethers to your smartphone. And it means that when you go out and about, you can take light phone with you, you can go light and you still have the ability for people to call you, to text you, um, but, and I think they have maps and, and maybe a bit of music on there, but that's it. You know, there's no, there's no WhatsApp, there's no social media, there's no email. It's a clean device um, and it tethers to your smartphone. So it's the same number, but it just takes all the clutter away. And um, I would love, I would love to have one of those working in the UK right now, because I think it'd be amazing. Weekends, you know, evenings, you just go light. You don't need to take your smartphone with you all the time. You don't need that full set of tools. Georgie, it won't mean as much to you being in the UK, but um, what you were saying about not opening up an email or a text unless you know you have the time to respond to it, I call that Ohio, only handle it once, as opposed to Iowa, immediately open and walk away. So, you know, it's um, unless you know you have the time to actually respond, don't even open it. It's really hard. And that's where, you, where we end up wasting our willpower sometimes, you know, just having it available to us. Yeah, and one of the things, Marcy, I'm not sure if you do the same, but when I talk to individual clients or people about this, I say a bigger indicator of bad habits often isn't necessarily the amount of time you spend on your device, but it's how many times you're picking it up in a day and how many times you're kind of interrupting yourself or what you're doing or it's kind of coming in. Um, and yeah, those pickups kind of can tell a big story. We, we use uh, Gloria Mark's um, statistic in our marketing material quite a bit. Every distraction and interruption costs you 23 minutes, but it, it really hits home when uh, you have to go through these cognitive shifts each time you pick up your device. And, you know, you don't actually know where you're going to get pulled to, but, you know, having, having that moment to stop and say, okay, I know where I could get pulled to because that text or that news story, you know, do I need to do this right now? Um, you know, I would say like the, the big thing that we have learned from our time um, developing freedom, talking to customers who use freedom is that uh, people are generally okay. Like the world doesn't end for the most part when you go offline for a few hours. A couple of times it has, you know, but like <laughs> most of the time it doesn't. So, um, and like that's, that's, there's an interesting brain training that goes on there. It's like, no, I'm going to be back in four hours and things are going to be okay. I've got my emergency kind of bailouts. You know, my kids can call me, but, um, you know, I am going to be uh, offline. And um, so, yeah, really, really interesting, you know, how we have to apply kind of a mindful approach to that. I think we had a, a point back there. <clears throat> yeah, and you might get to this later question, but every corporation has work-life balance. Yep. And those programs tend to be, and I come from the corporate tech world, so I kind of like those. Uh, you know, okay, we'll have uh, no meeting Friday afternoon, you know, no meeting scheduled work. You know, and then, you know, 
know when there's an intent, maybe, but it's not effective. It seems like why work. And if we had a, a corporate sponsored, you know, bag, you know, rather than trinkets and trash, so everybody gets bag and it's part of the corporate culture then that you get home or whatever. And now, by the way, there are certain roles and responsibilities you can sign up for this where no, there is no downtime. You have to be available because of the nature of what you do. But in, that's not most employees. Yeah. Okay. But if at home, if we're uh, like the company I work at with three letter <coughs> acronym, um, and, uh, you know, emblazed it on the, on the bag beat, the well, you know, the work life balance, where every employee got the bag beat that's, you know, said, you know, relax or disconnect. And it was, became part of the culture. You got home, boom, goes in there and becomes a, a badge of courage or whatever. And it's also intentional, and the family sees it, knows, I, uh, dad, thank God, uh, is, is disconnected right now. Because that way you inject, and maybe you're already doing this, but it has to become part of the corporate culture within which the employee, otherwise you're fighting your own little private war, struggling against the machine, you know, uh, that's forcing it. That's not the one that I had. The other thing I'll get to is, <clears throat> yeah, the kids are all growing up. Grandkids, you know, three years old on an iPad, you know, they're embedded in technology. For them, it's all fun and games and things like that. But that's the world they're literally going to grow up in a world aside from anything else where all they're going to do is work with technology and be kind of embedded in their experience all the time. Uh, any thoughts on where, where you're headed with your ideas? Uh, when I say counteract that, I don't know if counteract is the right word, but that's a reality, it appears. So where the world is at, especially for younger kids, what that's going to do to them, how badly they'll be screwed up. You know, as they get older, I don't know. But that's a, it's a good point. It's a, it's it's actually segueing nicely into like where we're where we're going to go. And I think the discussion of um, devices, policies, <laughs> and, and the workforce. And I was thinking, like Marcy, you probably have some thoughts about this. How do you how do companies actually create a culture of well being? You you talk to so many of the large corporations. Um, maybe is that, can I hand that to you for some thoughts? Yes, and I have to, because you said no meeting Friday, um, I have to speak on that. One of our largest clients had that for a few years. And what happened was all the meetings that they couldn't fit in during the week, they scheduled for Friday. Hmm. And they would, yes, yes. <laughs> and for all their private coaching sessions, they would want me to open up Fridays because they're like, that's the only time I have time. I'm like, but I'm a meeting. You know, that's, that's supposed to be your time to relax. So they often don't work, um, things like that. And also it's, it's a blanket solution without really thinking about the, you know, everybody within the company and their roles and so on. Um, the biggest thing that I have seen since the pandemic, when so many people went remote, is that it was so fast that there were no technology guardrails put in place. And guardrails are not barriers. Guardrails keep us safe. When I am driving around uh, along the Blue Ridge Parkway, I want that guardrail. You know, it makes me feel better. And it's okay to have digital, like, you know, I'm available during these hours and I can be, I'm available, you know, you can contact me through Teams and Outlook, but you cannot contact me through text. You know, we didn't set, the companies didn't set these guardrails up for people. It was just wild, wild west. And part of it was not their fault because it was for some literally overnight, you know, come and get your laptop and don't come back for two years. And so now, and then bad habits get in place. And even the people who had good habits, for a time, we were afraid to put our phone away because our parents might get sick or our kids might get sick or and people were literally dying. And so we, we got this, we got such bad habits and it's hard to go back. The other thing that I express to leadership always is that it does not matter how many times you say, I work during off hours, don't feel like you have to respond. I send you an email on a Saturday, don't feel like you have to respond. If you are in a position of hierarchy, most people will feel compelled to respond. If they know you as their boss, 
works at night or on Saturdays, they will feel compelled to respond. And so using technology to save yourself from yourself by implementing things like you know, delay send or inbox pause or things where it's not getting into people's inbox, being courteous and respectful. Um, it's kind of going back to manners almost when I'm working with companies. But again, it, it, it's not all their fault, but now we're trying to undo bad habits. Can I just add on to that? I feel like Marcy as well, kind of looking, if we're looking at like the underlying causes a lot of, a lot of this, is of like how is presenteeism and the need to kind of have face in the office and be there around the clock and show dedication to work. It's kind of, we, we then were no longer in the office, we were at home and we had to find new ways to still show that we're really important and that we're working all the time. And so communication just went Poof! and people have to have more meetings and they're sending more messages. They feel like they need to be able to respond immediately if a Slack comes through to show that they're there. And it's kind of like we've, we haven't stopped to say, hang on a minute, <laughs> being immediately available at any point in time doesn't mean that I'm doing good work. <laughs> like, in wow. fact, it means I can't be doing good work because I'm too busy checking my messages or being available for meetings all the time or, or, or working on my email. And I think it's sort of like, there's, a, there's this deeper culture change that needs to come where companies are very clear that if you're gonna do good work, you can't be available all the time um, and <clears throat> people need to have rest and they need to have their defined work hours um, but that we need to give people the space to sort of yeah to, to be able to do their work and, and it it seems to me I I'm, I'm, you, you work with a lot more organizations than I do right now but it seems to me this kind of there's there's a split in organizations and increasingly the ones we talk to the leaders of of, of the future of work that come on the podcast for instance they've all they've all gone beyond that and certainly that's how freedom works Basically, if you're on Slack, you're not doing work <laughs> and it's a bad thing, but it still feels to me like the old school kind of presenteeism model of let's we work every single hour God gave. That's how we um, show that we're really valuable in our work. We want to always be available. We sacrifice everything for our careers is still a large part of how companies are operating. Um, so how do you have com conversations with leaders about how to move from that sort of model and that mindset shift, that cultural shift? And obviously the technology is just a layer on top of that, but how do you how do you encourage them to think differently about that? And there's a difference between reactivity and responsiveness. When I get an email immediately back from somebody, my first thought is, oh, they must not have anything to do, or they must not be doing their work. And you know, my accountant, I even you know questioned him one time because he was so reactive, and I'd say, like, Joel, you know, do you not have enough business? You know, I mean, it's like you're, you're able to respond that easily. So it's, it's interesting when I hear different perspectives, like I want my people to respond immediately. Well, if you're in customer service, yes. But um, I don't want mine to respond immediately because that means they're living in their inbox. Yeah. Actually, uh, you touched two very important points. Um, and, you know, one of them we've been talking about, you know, like culture. Um, and I think that part is, uh, is very important because, you know, like, um, if you add, for example, one bag in the in the meeting rooms, like the impact is not going to be that huge, you know. I think you need to work on the on the cultural uh, culture transformation, and for that you need like uh, to involve the leadership team. Uh, you need to do like um, different things, you know, like some sessions, some programs. You might also like uh, if you do offsets with your company once a year, there is a digital detoxing element added to it. Like I think we need a more integrated approach to digital wellness in the corporate space. I think that is very, very important. Um, so, um, and for that to happen, we need also like the leadership team involved, right? Um, so it's important and it's communicated that is important. Now, something that is important there is, we have to understand also that digital well-being, it's a part of well-being, right? So I think, you know, it's important also to start with well-being first. Uh, and set up like a um, well-being, um, you know, like develop like a positive well-being in the company, you know. So, for example, you know, I remember there were in my previous agency there was this breakfast. If you come earlier, you have a breakfast free, and and you know, then you look at the breakfast and it's not the healthiest thing. So it's like, um, you know, like is this really making an impact? It's not, you know. I think companies need to start tapping first already on the well-being um, 
aspect uh, as, a, as a holistic thing. And then adding digital wellness also as a, as a key element for that well-being uh, overall uh, goal. I think that that is important. Um, and another thing that you mentioned, and you know, you were you were mentioned how um, employees they go home after that, and I think this is very important. It's a, it's very important things like employees are people, you know, they are normal consumers as well. So I always say like digital well-being in the workspace starts at home. You know, I think it's important not only, you know, oh, we're going to set up these programs in the, in the workspace. So when you come to the work, the, when, when you come to work, you are digitally healthy. And then, but then you go home and you just like spend eight hours on your screens and you sleep with your phone next to you. And, you know, like it's not going to work. Like that's, that's why it's important about like, um, it's all about like habits. And those habits actually are not just in the workspace. Actually, it's important to build those when people, you know, are at home. And I think that that part, uh, it's, um, it's very important, you know, and sometimes we forget that digital well-being in the corporate space, in the corporate space, it starts at home, you know? Uh, you know, my point was in the, in the um, work-life balance programs, again, which I have experience in the industry, it's always at the macro level. Make sure you take your vacation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, no meeting Friday afternoon. But it's that, it's that everyday living experience that, to the extent you could, I'll say, augment on the margin work life balance programs with these also day to day operational at home things as sponsored by the company. Yeah. That would probably have more impact for the company than the, make sure you take your vacation. Oh, by the way, I have your phone with you all the time. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's also like when you want to, like, uh, you want to do the four days uh, work week, right? Um, if you think about it, it's like how that is going to impact the other four days where you're working, you know, like it's not, it's not simple. Sometimes we want to simplify, but uh, it's not just about just like, okay, uh, I'm going to just remove one thing. Uh, uh, corporations are organizations and as such, they work as systems. So you cannot just like uh, remove one thing and expect that anything is going to happen. It's like how you mentioned like, oh, I created like freedom at the beginning and it was just like a switch off. Uh, in, uh, of the internet, and it's like done, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> no. yeah. Can I address four day working? Sure, yeah. absolutely. Um, well, actually, first, I want to say I did use freedom to write all three of my books, <laughs> but what worked even better than freedom was I went to Umstead and where I got I would get no self or no service, and I wouldn't take a hot spot or anything, and I could go exactly two hours and 10 minutes on my Mac without it um, shutting down. And that's where I wrote a lot of my book as well. But I have a company right now that is considering, that has been asking me about four day work week because they have a department that really wants to go that way. The thing is most people are only productive about four to five hours a day, max. All studies show this. Nobody is productive eight, nine, 10 hours. So there's that also, if you're saying that some, that people need to work nine and a half or 10 hours in four days to put in their work, put in their work week, my clients already are doing that. So the workload is not on it, but is not going to be reduced for them, but yet now they're expected to get it in those four days. And what's going to happen is they're going to work on Fridays and think that this is like, oh, this is my day to catch up. And so it just doesn't always work. And there's a great book called, um, I think it's called the five hour work day, something. And he talks a little bit about this as well, but it's also putting an entire company into a box too, where, you know, maybe people don't want to work nine and a half or 10 hours, you know, because they want to go to their kids soccer games at four or five. Um, what we do is we have no task Fridays. And that is just where, and well, we don't, um, I never schedule clients on Fridays, but we are not allowed to assign each other tasks on Fridays. Mm -hmm. That's our thing because we, that way we can finish up um, everything before the weekend. And so we, we, we're still working, but we're just not assigning things to each other. And that's worked well for us. Mm -hmm. So it's really figuring out like what works best for each company, but not taking an idea 
that you know maybe somebody else has put out there and just assume that it will work for you. And um, can I just carry on on that because yeah, um, yeah so the four day work week I actually think has huge potential um, and but I've only come to realize that since working at Freedom and, um, and, and hosting the podcast and talking to a number of people who are already kind of on board with the idea. And I think I, <clears throat> for, a, for a company the size of Freedom, it's, it, it works, it can, it can work. And we do do it through the summer on alternate, um, alternate week. And we also have a number of Freedom Fridays through the year. So we don't do it every week, but we do often have four day work weeks. And the reason it works is because there is so little fat and clutter in our days. We have minimal meetings. We don't use email. Um, everything is project based. Um, everyone is remote. So we all we all have periods in our day or lots of us have periods in our day where there is no one else online at the same time. So you have clear spaces to actually just do your work. Um, it's For me, it's, it's a totally different way of working to say working at Google where there was so much fat, you know, you'd sit in a lot of meetings and often not have very much to say. Um, you were CC'd on a million emails all the time. Um, and there were also lots and lots of layers of approval. Now, I guess I say, I say it works for a company like Freedom because I think the size of a company makes it easier. Yeah. Get to a much bigger organizational structure, it's obviously much, much harder because there are layers of approval that processes have to go through and you have to get a sign off. Um, but I don't believe that it's, insurmountable I think what needs to happen is maybe instead of saying let's move to four day work week I think companies need to say let's just look at the way people are actually spending their time in a day and how much of it is actually work and how much of it is just noise and distraction and kind of just really work that doesn't need to happen you know <laughs> work for the sake of work which happens a lot as well and it kind of ties back to this presenteeism you know it's this kind of idea of like I'm working on this thing and this thing and this thing and this thing. but actually what is really moving the company forward um so yeah I, I kind of uh, speaking to a number of the, the sort of experts we had on the podcast who are just they're just laser focused on work that's actually going to make an impact for the business and then everything else just doesn't need to happen um mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it's a big challenge for organizations, but I don't think it's insurmountable when you can look really critically at everything that's happening within a company and what really needs to happen and what can be what can be cleared out. Yeah, I think it's the size of the company, absolutely. And also right-sizing the workload for people. Um, a lot of the companies that I work with, they the workload is the number one reason why people are burned out and overall. Nobody calls me because they're doing well. <laughs> um, so it's I'm over, you know overload and burnout and it's number one workload number two meetings mm -hmm. and if you if you're already overloaded with your workload then compressing it into four days just isn't realistic and I, I actually have one company that their motto is one size too small so if they need five people to do the job they do it on four and they're feeling the effects of it in their workforce. It's I have a oh, oh, yeah, no, go ahead. Just um, relating to that, you know, we're talking a lot about hours worked, and there's a huge push on measuring based on productivity or output. Mm -hmm. And what's your opinion on that? You know, I, I just reflect one of my best workers, I know work the least amount of hours, but produce the most. Yeah. And so, how does that all relate to this conversation? Well, how do you measure output of creativity and strategy and planning? You know, and as knowledge workers, that's what you're, I mean, nobody's hired because they're amazing email checkers. <laughs> you know, I mean, no job have I ever interviewed for and said, I am the best at checking email. I am the fastest at Slack. You know, you don't do that. And um, so I think we're measuring the wrong thing, you know, unless it's something like your IT and you're dealing with tickets or something yeah. like that, we're, we're measuring the wrong thing. Yeah, there's also this point where, um, you know, I'm, I'm hearing it between Georgie and Marcy, um, where organizations are going to need to sort of be honest with themselves about the capacity of their workers, mm -hmm. the uh, capacity of the days. And yeah, this, this notion that um, a knowledge worker can do eight hours of work a day. You know, we don't have these discussions where knowledge work is taxing. 
is physically taxing. Thinking is hard. It is really hard. Yeah. I just, I remember when I would, would teach at Sills and you know, you teach a two and a half hour course and I would be just so tired at the end of that because you use your brain for those, you know, two and a half hours and your brain burns a lot of calories. I think we all know that, but like, yeah, heavy brain use is just, it is exhausting. And so anyway, that's another tangent, but, um, but like, you know, this, this idea that if we can start to be honest with ourselves around the amount of time that, you know, um, spend in meetings versus actually doing, uh, sit, sitting down and doing productive work, realize we've only got a couple of hours a day to do this. And, um, you know, not to send things in a different direction, but I think we heard some of these things like, how do we get organizations broadly defined? How do we get the culture to accept that like, there are these realities? And if we start working within the realities of, you know, you've only got so many hours in the day and the knowledge worker can only do so much work. Uh, if we accept these realities as truth, then we can start to design policies around them. But does that come from the top down? Does it come from the bottom up? Like, how do we actually get there in organizations? I, I am just, I'm just following up that, Fred. I just want to say back to you a quote you gave me on the podcast a while ago, which was that knowledge work is endurance work. And it's a responsibility of organizations to create the environment where basically their athletes can perform at their best. And, um, and so, yeah, I think that's really important to think about. Um, and I think also just to reflect on the fact that we kind of, what we've done is apply the factory model of productivity to knowledge work. And that's how we're all working. It's like nine to five, you check in, you check out, kind of duh, 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 you do as much as you can in that time. And that's kind of, and then you move up the ranks and, and it's kind of recognizing that probably maybe that's just not a system that works for humans and um, the skills that we're trying to, to deliver, which is creativity and increasingly emotional intelligence and building the right kind of connections and thinking, you know, thinking strategically, thinking originally. Um, and so, yeah, I, I loved your analogy of kind of you know, knowledge works, insurance work, let's get the systems right to make that happen. In terms of how the environment and the, the competitive dynamics are going to change, I feel like, you know, challenger companies that are coming through that are working in this way naturally will create change in bigger organizations because because talent will opt to work for those companies where they feel like they actually can do their best work which makes you feel great about your job and which makes you feel well in your life and you're connected to values and you feel like you're you know you're making progress and um you're not being bogged down and burnt out and drawn down by all the other stuff that can happen in other organizations so maybe there'll be an element of just con competitive kind of dynamics where these new these new ways of working um do force bigger organizations to relook at how they are operating just in 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 order to retain or um attract talent there you go. yeah my my uh, my head and my um my psyche is um um swirling with um uh, thoughts and feelings and the feelings are feelings of guilt um this I'm, is an intervention, Gary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell us how you feel, yeah. Gary. Sorry. Tell me what you want. Well, it started yesterday. Yeah. You know, uh, um, I made a note about, you know, don't send emails at 3 a.m. And then it, it came, came up today again. To, to delay to send, <laughs> use delay send. And yeah. I have to admit, yeah. I'm part of the problem. And, and it's not, I mean, I, I don't do social media for, you know, for fun, but I definitely abuse, I guess, everybody, because uh, my own sort of sense of um, always working is, um, as Dean, I guess I had really um, sort of appreciated that, you know, there are literally hundreds of people who are getting emails from me at, you know, any random time, and I don't really, it, because it's an email, not a text, I know that difference, but maybe people aren't interpreting that email that comes in, you know, and they wake up at six and they see this email from the dean at four o'clock and, and, and they feel like they have to respond. And um, so let's say that, uh, you know, I, um, I, I, do a, I do a purge, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna transform myself now. And so starting tomorrow, I'm gonna batch, you know, <laughs> whatever I'm doing when I'm not sleeping. Uh, and uh, you know, make sure that it doesn't get sent till like 8 a.m. Um, how would I begin to know if I'm making a difference uh, in um, 
in my school. Uh, uh, I mean, would uh, uh, it, it, you know, because it's going to be hard, right? Um, you know, it's so much easier to just get it off my the top of my plate right now to do the SEM and not have to worry about it. So if I now have to take one little extra step to sort of batch it, and and, uh, and then you know I'm probably going to also then check. Uh, you know, the, the next day that all these emails went out, um, is, is there a way that that I can begin to sort of get some reinforcement that what's the way I'm changing uh, is? I, I think this is a management issue, right? And, and, and so, you know, are there things that, that we can do to sort of help ourselves um, as we, if we start to make those kinds of shifts uh, to, so that I get some reinforcement, right? I mean, no one's gonna thank me, right? I mean, that's, because they're just not gonna see that until the next day. I mean, but are there, have you seen strategies or things that, you know, sort of people um, can, uh, and tell that they're making a difference if they, you know, really do start to, um, you know, try to be more conscious about yeah, digital loans. I think the interaction, no, the interaction with you, I'm pretty sure it's changed. You know, if you stop sending the emails before, probably there are some people that would say, hey, hi Gary, they're like, hey, hi Gary, how are you doing? And they're like, hey, how are you doing? You know, like, <laughs> I, think, I think that, you know, you can already uh, notice the, uh, Improvement for sure. <laughs> the other thing that goes along with this is, is um, uh, that, and this is part of the you know the discord in my in my head right now is um, you know there's a lot of evidence that I think the Microsoft study that uh, you know, we had a, a, some extensive analysis of it, it, in the fall symposium you know, sort of shows that that um, yeah you can get a lot of productivity when people are working remotely or or sort of uh, off site, but the social interaction. Uh, it is is uh, is lacking, it, especially for new employees. Right? How do you kind of you know be, uh, uh, come into an organization? And and so I I'm, I'm trying to reconcile the things that I'm hearing yesterday and today that I should be doing or we should be doing at Sills. I mean, do we at Sills say students can't bring a cell phone into class? Ooh, you know, forget about it. They, you know, they all drop, right? But if you had a bag be a phone holder, <laughs> did they put their names in the seminar classes? Yeah, these in the seminar classes. Yeah, I mean, that's there is the, the larger point here is it is a culture shift, mm -hmm. and um, you know these. Um, I I'm Marcy can speak to this. George can speak to this. One can better than I can. But you know, all these things um, require decisions, and they require. Um, I, I think evidence. I mean, they, they, um, we can change our behaviors, but kind of like what you were saying, the, um, you know, we can put these things down on paper, but it requires doing and it requires analysis of it and retrospective. And um, it's a, it's an investment that organizations need to make. You know, I was, I was, um, we were talking about the 40 work week. Um, Alex Pang, who uh, is a frequent guest on the podcast and one of the leaders of the 40 work week movement. He actually is now working at a consulting agency, which is going in and helping companies with this transition. Um, and, you know, it's like we, we want to provide these tools to help people be digitally well. And, like, it's easy enough to, like, read a blog post and, like, say, okay, here are some of these things. We'll, we'll try and do them. No, it is not that easy. It's, for, a, for a company our size, it's even not that easy. And I'm, like, I'm helping Alex with... Um, we're sharing our story with a couple of other companies and it's you know 20 30 40 50 people companies and you go up to like a you know uh at a big four accounting firm like you really need to invest um in uh, in, in implementing these programs uh, and it's and, and it won't offset will solve it i just a counter um to the sort of scheduling your email um which to me, it, it is an extra step, it's, a, it's courteous, but some pe sometimes people will say, you know, it's on them to check their email or not. And I agree with that too. But again, when you are in a position of hierarchy, yeah. which you are the highest of the hierarchy, <laughs> sounds like, um, if they know that you send emails at 4 a.m., then when they wake up in the morning, they may be like, okay, let me, let me see what Gary sent overnight. 
Um, so it it really depends to and like you said, culture shift, but you've had yeah, to that so, yeah. yeah, part of my career strategy for wellness was always never to have a job where I had to be there regularly at 8 a.m. because I am not a morning person. Good. So yeah. part of my wellness is I send the email after the normal working hours <laughs> because that's when my working energy is higher. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I, there is no way that I would like change that. And, and also we're in a global economy. Yeah. If you have global employees in your company, then how do you schedule email so that mm -hmm. you're making sure that all of them go in or whatever strategy you're using to communicate? Well, Outlook just came out with something um, through their Viva Insights where as long as a person has their work hours on their calendar, mm -hmm. when you press send, it just lives in the cloud until their work hours. And then it gets delivered. And I was like, beautiful. That's perfect. That's like France without having to be French, you know? Um, so I thought that was good with, I use the G Suite platform and I use the Boomerang app, which delays my send all the time. And I delay it within certain hours, but I do have to make a decision. Like what time does this person normally work? Are they on the West Coast or East Coast? Um, really it's, I mean, it takes an extra few seconds, but ultimately I want that email to be read. So it's worth the extra few seconds for me to get it in their inbox between, you know, or what I think might be their working hours are. Like if I worked closely with you, I'd probably know that I, that you work, that you're an evening person. And I would schedule it later. I would not schedule it at seven or eight. But if um, you did, I wouldn't care. What, right, right. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> yeah, because you, because that's your, you've said good tech guardrails. That's, so you have, you are somebody who has good tech guardrails. I, I know Georgie is thinking about the, the world without email, Cal Newport. So, oh, that's a great book. You know, the, um, so many of these problems that we're discussing are, are comms problems. And like, they're not going to get easier because of some of the points that Libby's raising, mm -hmm. like the, um, the fact that we uh, are a global workforce, that we work around the clock. Um, and, and, and that's normal. Like, you, you know, it's like, it's funny, like when we started hiring people in Europe, the question was like, Oh, do I need to time shift to come over and like work on your schedule? And like we hired a guy uh, in Russia many years ago, and he was going to do that. And it's like, no, that unless that's your chronotype, like that is going to yeah. ruin your life. No, so we we're going to have a little bit of overlap, but mostly you're going to work your hours. And in Europe, it's a lot easier because we we've got some real overlap. Um, but these that's that's the future that we live in. That is the present and. And these problems are comms problems, and they can be solved with tech, you mm -hmm. know. And so Cal's book is a lot about this. We talked to him on the pod, and um, yeah, it's it's again like, what's the what's the throughput to get this stuff into organizations? It's it's tough. And at our company, we only email external clients. We never yeah. send emails to each other. We use our project management system. I never have to ask if something is done. It's everything is that is in there, and so it's only external. And it's and that's great. What we, that's what we're doing at Freedom, and it's is a yeah. game changer. You just oh, realize yeah. unnecessary internal communication can happen in companies, and how toxic. And so that's coming back to the email thing. I was going to say is sort of this. For anyone who doesn't understand how this works, maybe it's worth explaining it because until I worked at Freedom, I didn't know this was a model. Basically, so at Freedom, I don't know what project management tool you use, Marcy, but we just use Trello boards. So. Um. On Trello, when you work on a project, you create a card and goes through a process where that card gets approved so people are, are aware of what work you're working on. You add updates to the card. If you've got questions about that project or need feedback from other people, you call out, you, you know, you ask for it on the card. And then anyone that's involved in that project can go to that card when it's the right time for them, when they have the time to do the work, they can engage with what's happened since they last engaged with the project, add in, kind of contribute to it, and then go away and then it's ready for the next person to pick up. And in that whole interaction, in that process moving forward, there's been no slacking, there's been no email, there's been no WhatsApp, like there hasn't even been a meeting. Um, and asynchronously, this work has kind of progressed. And it does amazingly move really fast. Like the projects do move fast because you're not being distracted by the pings and the emails that you have to respond to. You're just there, okay, this morning I'm gonna work on this project for two hours, then I'm gonna work on this project for an hour, then I'm gonna have one meeting and then I'm gonna have my afternoon sessions, whatever it might be. 
And it's really, it's very, it's, it's, it's an incredibly efficient way to work. Um, but I think most companies are not yet working like that. And yeah, uh, yeah so I, I think that is the simplest thing you can do. But on the email point, the communication point in general as well, I think, and this comes back to the intentionality piece, and Gary, maybe this can help you too, is kind of always putting yourself in the position of the recipient every time you write an email, not just in terms of when or they might be reading it, but like, are you actually just bothering them? Are you just trying to make your life easier by sending this, this email to them? Like, is it gonna make, is it worth the interruption that you are serving them with <laughs> in order to send this email? And I feel like it's same, it's the same with WhatsApp. So in our social lives and kind of whenever we communicate with people, I think we need to spend more time putting ourselves on the feet of the recipient to think, how are they gonna receive this? Is this beneficial for them? Is this actually just a cost on their life? And if it's at a cost on their life, you know, like what am I getting from it? Does it outweigh and kind of look at the overall effect of that, that piece of communication? Would they pay you for this email? <laughs> yeah. Would they pay you a dollar to receive this email? Is it, is it worth that? Um, I often will think that. Um, but we use ClickUp as our project management system. And I actually did a podcast just, I think it was a month ago, of why companies will never get out of email help. And it was because yeah. they're not using project management systems. Yes. Yeah. And Slack and Teams are not project management systems. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. no I, yeah. I will have companies say, yes, yeah. we use a project management yeah. system. We use Slack. I'm like, that, yeah. that is yeah. not a project management system. Your mail has been so long. Yeah. How about that? Yeah. 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 So I think we're we're wrapping up, and I can give the final point. Yes, one. No, oh, we have one more question. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. okay, thanks, Brent. Um, one, first of all, I wanted to say thank you for having a slide to ask one of the really most important questions: why? Mm -hmm. you, know, you told us your why, and I think that's very, very important. The other thing that keeps emerging for me through the, through yesterday and today is that we spend a lot of time talking about knowledge work. But really, everything I heard today is talking about culture work. Mm -hmm. And that, that's also something we need to be thinking about is how do we create space and capacity to realize that for many of us in our organizations, the task of creating culture and managing culture is essential to success. So, mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, should, yeah, I mean, it should be like someone like some. Uh, one of the questions that were like uh, we wrote like the other day was about like what are the uh, structural cha changes um, that are happening in organizations, you know? And I remember the other day um, I just uh, met uh, Jen Fisher, who is uh, the the, fel the first uh, well-being chief officer, you know, as a, as a job role, and I'm like, wow, you know, like. We have the CFO, we have the CEO, we have now we have the CW, oh, and it's amazing. And uh, this is a little bit like uh, responding to or adding to your uh, question. Um, I think those elements are very important, like having actually, like, a, you know, most of these roles come from the human resources department. So it should be actually, you know, there should be like a, a role for, you know, we can call it culture, we can call it like well being or, or anything like that. but that um, those those people are actually responsible for creating a better environment in the in the in the workspace in the organization, and because that actually impacts directly productivity. You know, the thing is that we use, we we think or we still think, and most of the, uh, uh, quite often that productivity is uh, more output less input, but actually it's not like that. You know, it's about doing the doing well, no, doing better the right things rather than doing more with less. And those things are actually impacting that qualitative elements that are important in organizations, you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, I think maybe, you know, having more people with those roles, you know, uh, might help. And it would be also beneficial for our companies as well, because then we have just to go directly to them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I think we're wrapping at 10 to 2. Oh, yeah. We have 15 minutes left? One more time, is there questions? Yeah, I have one more question. Oh, yeah. Um, so I, I'm trying to define digital wellness for a class of mine. And from my understanding, there's like four ways to see it on a grid. You have your user-centric, um, which like user uh, does what they need to do to be well. 
you have your uh, tech companies accommodating or like whoever the person in charge is, uh, what is it, uh, imposing these rules. Um, and then you have positive interventions and then you have these like preventing harmful interactions, so uh, negative interactions. Um, so would you say like, should there be policies in place from companies to promote digital wellness or is that not something um, that really needs to happen? Because I don't like, I don't know how you would argue in the best way uh, imposing these on people unless it's part of the culture. That makes sense. <laughs> I think policies, they, they need to be there, but you know, people don't follow rules. I mean, <laughs> nobody likes rules, right? So sometimes when we put a policy, it doesn't mean that if you put it on the wall, people are going to do it. And then it's where, you know, the cultural aspect or the culture shift is important. You know, it's, it's, it's just more complex, right? But, you know, I, I think policies are, are necessary, but within a um, bigger and more holistic approach. Yeah, I want to sort of build on, 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 on Brianna's point because, um, you know, one of the things I wrote down right at the beginning here is, you know, where are the boundaries between personal responsibility, which is the way we started, and then we start, and then we moved into sort of the corporate policies or enterprise uh, sort of policies, uh, and um, I guess uh, 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 if we start with personal responsibility, then that's something that like Sills as a school. And actually begin to do more and more as we make sure that our students are are not just they are aware at the very least and hopefully active uh, at, at, at more so um, to have that personal responsibility um, you know if you look at what's going on um, right now uh, coming in npr story on unions right so amazon's oh, having their um, I'm taking away all my reflection points oh here. sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe this is a, 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 a one of those massive shifts that's taking place for a whole lot of big contextual reasons. But um, how do we get the leadership in um, either corporations or libraries or archives or enterprises of, of any size to really buy in? And so that's part of you know my 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 struggle is okay um, if I change my behavior that's you know that's one small thing probably. But how do we begin to actually make those, those shifts? How do we get from that personal responsibility where we started to a, an enterprise responsibility? Does it just happen naturally over 20 or 50 years? Or, you know, or is it something that we can do um, in a little more a sort of conscious way? Uh, and because it seems to me that um, employees are, are going to be looking for more of this work-life balance. Part of it is the you know, workday, uh, you know, policies for um, uh, remote work, uh, and and it's a it's it, it's really in the air. You can't it, you can't go a day without sort of reading something about it. And I think this discussion has been really really enlightening for me, at least, to um, uh, think more carefully about uh, about it, not just from an individual point of view, but from that entity point of view. So uh, this is this been really fantastic. I know we've got a few more minutes uh, and, I, and there may be other questions from the uh, uh, the chat folks um, uh, out there. Uh, but uh, oh, yes, do we have questions on Zoom? We don't. Okay, all right. <laughs> well, I was going to just kind of following up on um, Gary's point and then I'll, I'll send it to you, Larry. Um, this, uh, there is this kind of interesting question where like we think about like benefits have largely been like, you know, these kind of line items on job descriptions. And, and some of them are kind of binary, like a 401k is a 401k, like it matches yeah. maybe that. Um, but uh, this idea like the, you know, flexible work or remote work, like that's like way more than just a, a line and it needs to have evolved policies behind it. And I'm going through this now, like as we grow and we're more remote, like, a couple of years ago, when it was just a few of us, it was pretty easy to manage that. Now, I, I want to have um, somebody who's kind of like in charge of a remote culture um, and like facilitates that. And, um, and I think that that is a differentiator for companies when they're hiring. I think that is going to be a differentiator when they're hiring. Um, and all of those kind of like 
these new challenges of flexible or hybrid or remote, and you need to have a lot behind that. So that's kind of my thought. I saw a job posting for head of remote work. Yeah. Like that, that's a new role. And, and it's going to be. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And there's, I mean, it, it, within like SHM, there's going to be like a whole, I, I can just see the future of like remote, uh, the people who manage the, you know, are in charge of the remote culture, the chief wellness officers, like these, you know, like this is, this is coming very shortly. Yeah, yeah so, so, and then you work with, so, so I become increasingly concerned about the social justice issues around the pandemic. People, we close the University of Colorado Libraries, which has about 900 employees. On March 13th, 2020, and on March 14th, 2020, not everybody was at home. The caretakers were there, the HVAC mechanics were there, so food service workers at least cleaned the up. And many of them worked the entire time. They actually weren't at home. So, so in that organization, there are probably 250 knowledge workers. The rest actually do widgets. I mean, they have jobs that tie them to desks, to you know, like, you know, an entire security staff who have to be present, uh, checking IDs now, with COVID vaccination status, and all of that. And what's happening is an exacerbated class issue. So the knowledge workers in one class, but they can be flexible. Can do all the things that you're talking about, and all the others have to do certain things, be certain places, be there. You know, they work out of time, they don't work out of time, they get paid over time. But it really has greatly exacerbated the class system. It always is in libraries, where librarians are sort of the priestesses, and priestesses, but it's made that much worse. And I guess I'm wondering about companies where there is this hybrid organization. And how do you actually manage that? Because I see at the University of Toronto, at least increasingly, the faculty are talking about you know, they should have the option to teach online or not, and they're really pushing hard, and they don't want to come on campus, and it's about safety. At the same time, they're saying the classrooms have to have six air exchanges per hour, so the mechanics have to be there. They want the classrooms cleaned every day by people who do it physically, and all the rest that goes with that. I'm just saying it's growing social problem, and it really is sort of knowledge workers and then everybody else. All that it's interesting. Except physicians have to be where they are to do their job. Um, nurses do. I mean, so there are a lot of kinds of categories of employees that are not those, those kinds of employees that you're describing that have to physically be at their job. Also, there are. There are. Although I'll tell you, Canada, many physicians. Increasingly less now will not go in. It's all, I mean, appointments have been virtual for two years. I think it's a, 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 a very valid point. And, you know, it's, it's interesting how, I'm, and I'm reflecting on engineering pools and like the, uh, you know, what I've seen in comp packages and just the changes. And, and, and you know, even going back to like, Facebook shuttles and Google eating at your office. I mean, like we have seen this move towards treating knowledge workers as a protected higher class. And um, I think it's it's only a desperate because yeah, when we have these discussions of remote culture, it is like, you know, how do you get the knowledge worker into the place where they're happiest because they are the most productive for the, uh, the organization. And you know uh, they're betting on like we can get fifty percent more productivity out of knowledge workers, you know, because we still have these ongoing questions around how do we measure it, how do we know, um, you know, and I and I see a lot of discourse out there around, you know, we haven't even scratched the surface of what we can get out of these people. So it is it's interesting. It's both like you know how do we increase the extraction, and then how do we like kind of manage these people into you know these states. But I mean broader broader context. You know, we're we're probably seeing a lot of turbulence at, at this boundary that I think will eventually bleed down into other parts of the, of the organization. And maybe we figure it out with knowledge workers first, but um, you know, it affects other parts of the organization. I have one question. Yeah. So with terms of pandemic, and you know, kind of shift to more of a hybrid approach. It, it kind of seems like there's an individual need within the workplace for um, 
for individuals across different teams. And so the workday, even in one office, looks different for individuals, um, more so than ever has before, where it was come to the office nine to five for everyone. Um, and with the introduction of more project management software or digital communication platforms, how do larger organizations and leadership begin to identify and approach the, the subject of um, choosing the best technology that works for individual needs that may differ across even one team with the organization? Well, I am not a fan of multiple systems. It just doesn't work. I mean, you're not going to please everybody all the time. And I mean, I have one company that I work with that all the departments are on different things. Like one uses Slack, one uses Teams, one uses Google, one uses Gmail, the other uses Outlook within the same company because the engineers don't like Outlook. I mean, it was just this crazy. And they were like, how do we start? I'm like, burn it up and start over. I mean, it's, it's so hard, but um, there, you know, there needs to be more research into the system that people, that the company is going to use. Cause what I see a lot of times are knee jerk reactions like, oh, Trello works great for freedom. We should use Trello. ClickUp works great for Raider Co. And they're a productivity company. So we'll use ClickUp. Maybe it's not the best one for you. And there's not enough research before they make the decision. And then there's also not training once they make the decision. They just kind of roll it out. And then people are expected to, to learn it on their own. And it really needs to be a very thoughtful process to do that. We have a Zoom question. Um, someone asked, how can we integrate psychology into knowledge work to create a social digital platform? I am, um, so I've been looking at this question because I love it. Um, and I think this is what apps like Freedom and other software products that will help support the future of work need to crack. Because at the moment, the way the technology is working, and it kind of relates back to the last question, I don't really know if there are there is the right software out there yet to really support hybrid collaboration and also encouraging users to do deep work in periods of the day and kind of managing all the different things you need to manage when you're doing your work. I, I don't really feel like there is a complete suite that that does that yet. Um, and there, but it will come. Like the technology is going to get a lot better. Realizing that you know we are hybrid or we're working remotely, and we have different needs than perhaps what is being delivered currently by the technology we have. But I think work that um, products that can start to understand individual psychology and how individuals work, which is obviously very unique. You know. What is the period of the day when you're most likely to get into your flow and to find, you know, have you have your deep thinking? When does when is that time of day need to be protected where all other notifications go away? I mean, you can schedule a freedom session, which is obviously really important. And it's a, it's a useful tool for that particular purpose. But actually, it could be part of something much bigger where the side where the where the tools understand, you know, in when, when you're trying to collaborate with someone where you where you hit a block point and you need to kind of un unearth it in some way kind of being triggered or nudged in the right direction to be able to do that um i know that um, when we spoke to shamsi inkbal mike microsoft are working on technology it's really interesting which basically recognizes when you're stuck on something and then can nudge you to take a break or to um try and look at it from a different perspective which i think is also really interesting so yeah like basically understanding the human mind understanding how the human mind works if knowledge work is equivalent to a body for an athlete you know that our, our brains are are, are is, is the piece that we need to optimize then working out more about how that brain works and and using creating technology that amplifies that and kind of enables it even better that is totally the key to the future of work and i think it's really exciting and we're only at the beginning of that that that's actually a really nice uh, way to uh, sort of uh, uh, put a put a cap on this. It's been a, a, a really great um, discussion. Thank you uh, to the panel. And uh, just to uh, 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 we, we'll be uh, we tried to build in breaks so that people could interact. There's uh, some goodies out there, I hope. Uh, and uh, 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 we'll be back for uh, Lori to lead a discussion uh, at uh, 10:45. Um, so let's thank the panel.